Next up, we have Ian Ballon, who's a shareholder at Greenberg Traurig. He is an IP and internet litigator um, and is also a specialist in copyrights. He is the co-chair of the firm's Global IP and Technology Practice Group. It's a pleasure to have Ian to give us an overview of what has happened in copyrights in the last year. Welcome back to the program, Ian. Thank you, Esther. It's, uh, it's always a privilege to be here. <clears throat> uh, never a good thing to go after uh, uh, Tom Irving. Uh, Tom's presentations are always terrific and high energy. And so no matter what I have to say, it's always a challenge to make it interesting. Luckily, there are a lot of interesting things happening in the world of copyright law, uh, but it is a pleasure to be here. I have a warm spot, particularly for Howard. My sister-in-law is a graduate from Howard and also um, a rising star on my team, Haley Tharp, uh, is a 2020 graduate. Uh, from the law school. So th thank you, Esther, and thank you to Latif and Tashi and everyone for putting this together. Hopefully you can see my slides. Uh, and uh, I wanted to mention that in addition to the slides, which I will make available later, they're not currently available because I was still uh, fiddling around with them this morning. Uh, I've included excerpts from my treatise, e-commerce and internet law. Uh, so if you are having trouble uh, sleeping at night, this is a good way to uh, come up to speed on copyright law and also uh, get uh, get some sleep. Um, let's jump in. Uh, there's a lot that, uh, that has been going on. And indeed, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court <coughs> uh, knew that, uh, that this conference was scheduled for March 4th. And so on February 24th, issued a new opinion. And uh, I will talk about that in a moment. Uh, but I wanted to give you an overview of what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to say a few words about the CASE Act, which are relevant to the issue of social justice, because it does make uh, uh, resolution more easily accessible to individuals. There also, of course, are concerns that it makes it more easily available to um, uh, <clears throat> to trolls as well. Uh, and I think it's going to have an interesting impact on DMCA claims, notice and takedown. So I'll say a few words about it. I know that there's a whole breakout session this afternoon, so I'm not going to say too much, uh, just a teaser for the later presentation. Um, I'm also going to talk about copyright fair use. There was a very important U.S. Supreme Court decision in the last year, Google v. Oracle, and I'm going to talk about that as well as some, um, as well as the the Warhol decision uh, um, in, from the Second Circuit, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about fair use involving art uh, and uh, and fair use involving social media. Uh, and then links and embedded links. I put on the on the board uh, NFTs and IP. I don't have any additional slides on it, but I think when we come back for the 20th anniversary pr a program next year, we may even have some law because there is some uh, there are some cases in litigation. Uh, NFTs, non fungible tokens, uh, are a way for people to monetize unique. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, you know, really almost, you know, any, any unique thing. It can, and it can include a work of art. Uh, there's some litigation involving Quentin Tarantino where uh, some unique pages from a script uh, were, uh, uh, were sold as an NFT. From a copyright law perspective, the issues so far have been pretty straightforward and really are very similar to any time an, a, a work of art or photograph is uh, provided in any medium, which is uh, someone, uh, if they own the rights, they can sell you an NFT. Of course, I can't uh, take someone else's book, turn it into an NFT and sell it to you without uh, potentially infringing for, uh, for reproduction and distribution. Uh, but if it is my own work or if I have a license or if it's in the public domain, I can create an NFT and make it available to you. But that doesn't mean that you get other rights. If you buy a painting, you have the right to put it on your wall, but you don't necessarily have the right to reproduce it on t-shirts or posters. And so this has uh, tripped up at least a couple of people who bought NFTs and thought that they owned the underlying intellectual property. And unless you do, you don't have those rights. So that's something to, to watch for. I think we're going to have some case law in the next year. Um, so let me actually uh, mention the U.S. Supreme Court case, which 
uh, since it was decided so quickly, I put here in the overview slide for want of a, of a better place. It, it's a very interesting decision. It's an important decision, but it deals with a fairly narrow issue. And that narrow issue is errors in copyright registrations. And it really replaces what used to be um, uh, called the fraud on the Copyright Office doctrine. And, you know, we heard from Chip during his excellent presentation about concepts of fraud on the Trademark Office. Uh, there was a doctrine of fraud on the Copyright Office, and that was significantly loosened in a 2008 amendment to the, uh, to the Copyright Act. Uh, and you no longer need to show uh, fraud. Uh, it is sufficient that there is an error, but uh, um, a registration is deemed sufficient even uh, if it contains inaccurate information, unless one, uh, the inaccurate information was included in the application with knowledge that it was inaccurate, and two, the inaccuracy, if known, would have called, caused the registrar of copyrights to refuse registration. So that makes sense. A, an immaterial error um, shouldn't be, shouldn't have any effect, uh, but if it's material, if it would have caused the register of, co of copyrights to refuse registration, then the question is whether the inaccurate information was included with knowledge that it was inaccurate. And here the U.S. Supreme Court um, had a few things to say that are quite relevant and important. <clears throat> First of all, uh, they defined what knowledge means for purposes of the Section 411b1 safe harbor. And knowledge uh, means actual subjective awareness. So uh, <clears throat> it is not judged by an objective standard. It is judged by a subjective standard. That's the first very important part of the Supreme Court holding. And then second of all, the other part of the holding that's quite important is the Supreme Court held that it applies to both facts, uh, errors in fact, and errors in law. And that's also quite important. The error in this case was a legal error. Unicolors had filed a single application for 31 separate works, uh, which violated the Copyright Office's regulation, allowing a single application to cover multiple works only. Uh, if they were included in the same unit of production, which it turns out they were not here. Uh, and so the Supreme Court held that because Unicolors did not know when it filed the application that it had failed to satisfy this requirement, Unicolors was entitled to the safe harbor. So this is this is a significant decision. Again, a very narrow issue. It does not come up that often. Uh, I have had uh, two uh, fraud on the Copyright Office cases in my entire career. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, but it does come up occasionally. And when it comes up, it can be important. Now, in that case, H&M <coughs> argued that, that uh, construing knowledge to, uh, to, to, to look only at subjective intent was, was problematic because it would make it too easy for copyright holders to just claim lack of knowledge. Gosh, you know, I, I just didn't know. Uh, um, and, but the Supreme Court rejected this, saying that courts don't need to automatically accept the copyright holder's claim that it was unaware of the relevant legal requirements. Uh, the Supreme Court also said, and this is very significant dicta, uh, that willful blindness could support a finding of, uh, of actual knowledge. Um, and then the Supreme Court also said circumstantial evidence, including the significance of the legal error, uh, the complexity of the relevant rule, the applicant's experience with copyright law, and other such matters uh, may also lead a court to find that the applicant was actually aware of or willfully blind to legally inaccurate information. So, uh, you know, a lot to chew on there and uh, uh, a lot to look at in litigation in those instances where this issue comes up. And as I mentioned, it does not come up all the time. So let's jump into the first major area, fair use. There's a lot to talk about here. Um, <clears throat> uh, fair use uh, is determined under copyright law by a multi-part balancing test. This is different from fair use under the Lanham Act. Uh, uh, it lo it, courts look at the purpose and character of the use, including whether it's of a commercial nature or nonprofit educational purposes. Uh, 
the nature of the work um, with the, with courts holding that creative works are closer to the core of the in of intended copyright protection than informational or functional works. The amount and substantiality of the portion taken in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole, and the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. And you know there are a number of uh, of cases over the years. I've included an excerpt from my treatise on copyright fair use with lots of footnotes citing lots of cases. Uh, and um, uh, uh, you know in the uh, uh, in the past year, the most important case is the Supreme Court's Google v. Oracle case. I also list some other recent cases that I do discuss in the materials. Uh, and there have been some art cases, the Warhol Foundation case, which I'm going to talk about, uh, and then the Murano v. Metropolitan Museum of Art case, uh, which I discuss in, in my materials, um, and, then, uh, and then some other cases. So let's jump into uh, Oracle, Google v. Oracle. Um, I need to be a little bit circumspect in what I say because uh, I represented Google at the trial court in formulating the, the copyright uh, arguments on, uh, uh, in this case. So I also need to use, give my usual disclaimer, which I omitted to give at the beginning of this presentation because it's still early my time. I'm in California and uh, I logged into this presentation at 5.45 a.m. Pacific, which is honestly usually when I'm asleep. Uh, so I forgot my usual disclaimer that nothing I say today represents the views of my law firm or our clients or indeed my own views. Uh, everything I say is just offered to further the educational objectives of Howard University, and uh, nothing should be repeated back to me in a brief, uh, please. So with that disclaimer, let me, say, let me talk about Google the Oracle and why, in my completely unbiased opinion, I think this case was correctly decided. Um, in Google the Oracle, the U.S. Supreme Court, by a six to two majority, a very strong majority, uh, found that Google's re-implementation of 37 of 166 Java SE application programming interfaces, or APIs, in the Android mobile operating system was a fair use. Now, there also was the issue of whether these APIs were even copyrightable at all. And, um, uh, you know, for a number of reasons, it might have been, you know, more helpful to a lot of programmers if the Supreme Court had tackled copyrightability. Um, but between the lines, the U.S. Supreme Court, in this opinion, has a lot to say about software copyrightability, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but the Supreme Court focused only on fair use. Uh, and um, on the fair use issue, the court found that all four factors weighed in favor of fair use. And this is, this is quite in, unusual for, for anyone who, uh, uh, you know, anyone who ever uh, litigates fair use decisions. You know this is very unusual because e even in the best cases, usually courts say, well, these factors favor fair use, but, you know, these other factors weigh against it. But by balancing the factors, uh, we, uh, we find that it's fair use. Here, every single factor favored fair use. And again, reading this decision, it really elevates uh, the importance of transformativeness. So uh, remember, I mentioned that the purpose and character of the use, the first factor, uh, really looks at two, two factors, whether the use is commercial and whether it's transformative. The concept of transformativeness came from a law review article by Second Circuit Judge Laval in the 19, uh, late 1980s, and it was adopted by the Supreme Court in copyright case law uh, in the 1991 uh, Campbell case, which involved uh, uh, um, um, sampling of music in, uh, in a rap song. And uh, the court found that whether something is transformative is quite important uh, in evaluating fair use. In fact, it is, uh, it is the most important factor. The, uh, uh, the Google case in some ways really is the counterpoint to Campbell where the Supreme Court almost 30 years later reiterates uh, the significance of transformativeness. And the Supreme Court in both of those cases underscored that whether or not a use is commercial is really not determinative. And that is because, um, uh, you know, almost, almost all 
uh, you know, if, 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 sorry, the, the Supreme Court said if, if commercial use was determinative, then, uh, uh, you know, very, very few uses would be found a fair use. And, and conversely, uh, most of the significant fair use decisions by the Supreme Court and by circuit courts involve commercial uses. So it, it's not a very significant factor. Transformativeness, by contrast, is very important. And indeed, uh, I think after the, um, the Google case, there is no question that it is by far the most important factor. And if you read the opinion, you'll see that, that the Supreme Court in finding that all four factors weighed in favor of fair use, the fact that it was transformative permeated the analysis of the other three factors. <clears throat> With respect to the nature of the work, uh, the, uh, the court uh, and the court started there, and that's that's significant uh, also for this issue of copyrightability. Finding uh, that um, uh, that 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 software code is generally functional, which is typically further from the core uh, level of protection for copyright. So you have, <coughs> excuse me, by a um, uh, by an amendment to to the Copyright Act, software. Uh, is treated as a literary work, but the Supreme Court really strongly rejecting the analysis of, uh, of the Federal Circuit uh, 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 made clear that software is not like a book or a motion picture or a play, which, which are potentially much more highly creative, that software is more functional. And so this is important not only for fair use analysis, but also for um, uh, for copyrightability. Uh, with respect to the purpose and character of the use, as I mentioned, the court found that the use was highly transformative. That, that again, Google did not copy uh, the, the more expressive parts of the program. It only copied the APIs or interfaces, the things that were necessary for programmers to be able to call up standard routines. And so th this, this weighed very heavily in the Supreme Court's analysis of all of, uh, of, all of these factors. And um, uh, the, uh, uh, the court found that, that precise copying, indeed literal copying, uh, of uh, these APIs uh, was transformative for the purpose of creating the, the new Android operating system. Uh, and indeed, precise copying was essential because if you changed these APIs, if you changed some of the characters, they would not work. And so uh, precise copying indeed was necessary for Google's fair use purposes. With respect to the amount and substantiality, the Federal Circuit had found that Google took <coughs> too much. And the uh, <clears throat> the uh, the Supreme Court rejected that entirely, saying that Google's basic basic objective was not simply to make Java programming language usable on the Android system. It was to permit programmers to make use of their knowledge and experience using the Sun Java APIs when they wrote new programs for smartphones uh, on the Android uh, platform. The court also emphasized that what 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 was being discussed really was 37 packages, uh, you know, about a third of the, the, the APIs, uh, and approximately 11,500 lines of code out, out of uh, 2.86 million lines of code. So, um, you know, again, the, uh, the, the, the court looked at, at, at the broader picture. Um, in terms of the impact on the market, <clears throat> There were the, the, the court's decision is also quite significant. Oracle had argued that its mobile Sun platform, uh, you know, was essentially destroyed by Android. And, uh, and the court found, first of all, there were other problems and other reasons that, uh, that uh, Java SE never took off as a mobile application. It was a desktop application. Um, but but even, uh, even so, uh, to the extent that Android damaged that market, it was not because of, uh, of infringement per se. Very significantly, the Supreme Court focused in terms of looking at uh, the effect 
of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. The court found here that the relevant audience was program developers uh, and that they benefited. Um, so again, a very significant decision that will impact fair use case law um, and uh, uh, and 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 also to some extent software. Now, in the typical software case, um, you know, a court now may be more inclined to look at, at the issue of fair use rather than copyrightability because the Supreme Court itself took a pass on addressing copyrightability and instead focused on fair use. Fair use is not an issue that can be resolved on a motion to dismiss. It's going to require summary judgment or as in, in Google, an actual trial, uh, whereas copyrightability potentially uh, can be addressed on summary judgment, maybe in some circumstances, even a motion to dismiss. But the decision is still relevant to software copyrightability. Um, and uh, reading between the lines, the decision is going to be very helpful for software programmers because the Second Circuit's earlier 2014 decision in, uh, in Oracle v. Google uh, uh, took really a maximalist approach. Uh, the Supreme Court cited from uh, the Computer Associates v. Altai case and the Lotus Development v. Borland case. Uh, those are decisions uh, which, which uh, really underscore uh, uh, that software is functional and has limited copyright protection. Certainly, if you create an original software program, it will be entitled to copyright protection. But um, many aspects of the program involve the idea or they're, they're tied to the nature of the operating system or, the, or the, 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 the environment that they're written for and are not protectable under Computer Associates v. Altai. Computer Associates v. Altai, incidentally, for a, uh, uh, an IP and social justice trivia uh, quiz, if there is or ever is one, was a decision won by Judge Susan Braden, who I know is, uh, is a longtime supporter of this program and is speaking later today. Uh, both Computer Associates and Lotus v. Borland, I think, really established the law in this area with Oracle v. v. Google, the Federal Circuit decision, being very much the outlier, taking much more of a maximalist approach, looking at software like it was a work of art or, or a play or a novel. Uh, and, and this issue actually is now before the Federal Circuit, SAS Institute v. World Programming, a uh, decision by Judge Gilstrap in the Eastern District of Texas, finding that a program was not, in, was not copyrightable, uh, or at least the elements taken were uh, in creating an emulation SAS pro, uh, environment uh, was, was not infringing. So we may have a decision on that uh, coming up. Um, let me turn back to, uh, to fair use and let's talk about, uh, about a couple of other quick cases because I'm running low on time. Um, an important one, which I think is wrongly decided, uh, is the Goldsmith v. Uh, Goldsmith v. Uh, uh, Estate of Warhol case. It involves uh, the, uh, the musician Prince um, and the, the uh, famous photograph by Goldsmith on the right, and then a painting uh, of that by Andy Warhol on the left. Um, and in that case, uh, the, the Second Circuit had found that this use was not transformative, even though plainly um, Andy Warhol had, uh, you know, taken the photograph and made a number of obvious um, changes that, that, you know, many in the art wor world feel like if Andy Warhol is not transformative, what is? And, and fine art, you know, going back centuries has always been about borrowing concepts that inspire an artist and making them new and different. So this is of great concern. Uh, and what the, what the Second Circuit had done is they'd relied on a number of cases um, really looking at visual comparison. Now, after Google the Oracle was decided, um, the Second Circuit granted reconsideration, but they essentially reiterated their, their pre-Google the Oracle decision, which I think is wrong. Um, although, you know, what I say holds little weight. In fact, my treatise has been cited more frequently for the opposite proposition that it stands for, meaning that uh, some law clerk somewhere needed a site and found it on Westlaw, but uh, maybe didn't look at it that closely. But I think it's, it's wrong because um, 
what the, what the Second Circuit did is they essentially did a visual comparison. And they went back to Rogers v. Kuhn, Coons, which is a pre-Campbell case, a pre-transformativeness case, uh, a case involving literal copying, where the, where the artist Coons took the postcard shown on the left and sent it to a foundry in Italy and said, make a sculpture and, and be faithful to the original, make it look as close as possible. And it does. And so the court found this was not transformative. And of course, in that case, there was evidence that the artist was trying to make it look identical. Um, so that's obviously somewhat different. Uh, Blanche v. Coons, which is a post-Campbell uh, uh, transformativeness case, uh, the court found that the use of, uh, of the photo on the left from an ad in a collage, Niagara by Coons, was a fair use and was transformativeness. Uh, transformative. Similarly, in Cariou v. Prince, uh, the artist Prince, not the musician Prince, uh, the court found that the uh, photograph on the left, when reworked with additional painting, turning, uh, turning the, uh, the, the subject into a rock musician and adding some paint to his face, um, you know, added something new in terms of commentary and was a fair use. And so looking at these cases, uh, the Second Circuit said that even in light of Google the Oracle, when you look at these two uh, together, uh, it is not transformative because it is closer to Rogers v. Coons. But the problem is, as I say, Rogers v. Coons, the Second Circuit in applying Rogers v. Coons didn't even apply the transformativeness test. And as the Supreme Court has made clear in uh, Campbell and in Google v. Oracle, uh, whether something is transformative goes not just to a visual comparison, but to whether a work adds something new with a further purpose or different character, altering the first with new expression, meaning, or message. And that new expression, purpose, meaning, or message can include 100% literal copying. We have that even in the Google case. Google involved precise 100% copying. We have that in many cases, as I discuss in the excerpt from my treatise. Um, so there's a lot more I could say about this. I actually have a, ch have a, a chapter coming out this month in an art law book on uh, transformativeness and, uh, and fair use. I've got a couple of cases in litigation in the Second Circuit uh, on behalf of the artist uh, prints uh, involving social media. And so I'm, this is an issue near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm running low on time, but let me mention this other fair use case, an interesting one, O'Neill versus Radikowski. Um, this involved a picture, a fan posted this picture. She assumed uh, that the fan had the rights and so she reposted it on her own Instagram. It turned out this was a paparazzi photograph, so she didn't have rights. Uh, and she argued that this was a fair use. Uh, and the, uh, the, dis the district court found that it was a factual question, needed to go to trial, couldn't grant summary judgment either way. One of the factors was that she's holding flowers here. And so the, uh, you know, her face is obscured. And so the argument was it didn't really have much commercial value. There also is another issue with Instagram that I want to highlight, uh, you know, here from one of my own Instagram posts. This is from Father's Day last year uh, with my kids. Typical social media post is not just a picture, but also comments and the commentary. And that commentary may be important in, again, getting back to that core question about whether a secondary use, such as in social media, adds something to the purpose, character, objective, even if the image itself is identical. So this is also, of course, just a shameless plug for how adorable my children are. Uh, but it does raise a serious point about fair use in social media. So I have about two minutes remaining. Secondary IP, uh, the main thing I want to say, um, uh, the CASE Act. CASE Act creates small claims. Um, there is a whole session on it later today, so I'm not going to go into great detail, but a few things to keep in mind. Everyone says it's voluntary, but it's voluntary if you don't opt out. So this is where a lot of companies are going to are going to get tripped up, because if they're properly served, uh, and they do not opt out within 60 days, then you're bound by the decision. So you really need to alert your agent for service of process because for a lot of companies, you know, agents for service process often get letters and cease and desist letters and demands, you know, and things that aren't like court pleadings. Treat this like a court pleading. There are only three kinds of claims that can be brought, infringement, non-infringement, misrepresentation, 
Um, so for, for in the social justice realm, for individuals, this makes it a lot easier to, to vindicate rights. Uh, there's a $30,000 cap per proceeding. Individual claims are at a lower number. Um, so it's, it's small claims, but it is a way to vindicate rights. Non-infringement, the declaration uh, that, that what you're doing is not improper. Again, that's also very helpful in the social justice context for uh, individuals who are trying to make use of uh, uh, you know, of, of particular works or misrepresentation in connection with the notification or counter notification pursuant to 512F. And so I think we're going to see an, in the DMCA more of these brought because if a copyright owner overreaches, um, you know, right now a, uh, a user or a service provider has to file a federal court lawsuit. That's expensive. Now they'll be able to, uh, to bring a, a case act uh, uh, proceeding before the Copyright Office Copyright Claims Board. Uh, you don't even need a lawyer to do that. And so that's going to be quite significant. There's a whole panel of this afternoon. Um, let me mention that I, I'm not going to be able to talk about it, but on the slides, which I will make available, uh, there's now a circuit split on whether the CDA uh, preempts uh, state IP claims. And in the linking and framing area, there, there's been a lot of case law uh, the Ninth Circuit applies the, um, the server test. So an, a, an embedded link like here, uh, just from yesterday, an embedded link where the photo itself is not appearing on Twitter. It's just an instruction from the browser to access the photo on Twitter, but it appears to the user as, uh, as an image uh, under, the set, under the Ninth Circuit test that, is, uh, that does not create a public display, and so it's not actionable. Maybe there's a secondary liability claim, but there's no primary claim. The Southern District of New York in a number of cases have said that is a public display, uh, and many of those cases have been determined by fair use. I've put these on the board. Um, I didn't include an excerpt, or actually, no, I think I may have included an excerpt on links as well. If I didn't, feel free to email me. Um, if you're interested in the software copyrightability or the art issue, feel free to email me. The one thing I will say, though, in this embedded link issue is the Ninth Circuit issued a decision that essentially reiterates the, uh, the server test in 2021. And so that's important. There is a split, but it's not a circuit split. The Ninth Circuit is the only circuit that has, has spoken on this issue. So with that, uh, and apologize for taking two minutes out of the break, but let me turn it back to Esther. And again, thank you so much for appearing. This is one of my favorite conferences, uh, and it's always a pleasure to, uh, uh, to speak uh, before Howard University Law School uh, students, uh, faculty, and alumni.